A rhino gives its last breath as a tribe plunge spear after spear into its organs. It will soon be butchered and fed on for many days. Its organs and bone marrow to be prized and the flesh divvied up among the tribe. The bones will be used for tools and the skin for clothing. This rather successful day is not the norm of Middle Pleistocene Africa. Hunts fail, predators attack, and violent encounters with other groups occur. But for this moment, this one moment a long time ago, this tribe can share a meal beneath the stars, relive the hunt, and live to fight another day. Homo erectus was the first hominin to do many things. They pioneered complex tool use, conquered new environments, and cared for each other. Through discoveries we have learned that these ape men were much more human than we once thought. They cared for each other, took care of the disabled, and didn't look all so different. They are among our most important ancestors, and live on in you and I to this day. The first Homo erectus fossils were found in 1891 on the Indonesian island of Java by a Dutch doctor named Eugene Dubois. Prior to this discovery, Neanderthals were the only early human fossils known of. Dubois unearthed a tooth, a thigh bone, and most importantly, the top of the skull. This discovery originally baffled scientists. The theory of evolution was still relatively new and many didn't know what to make of it. It was upright, had a much bigger brain than a chimpanzee, yet was still primitive. In The Origin of Species, Charles Darwin controversially proposed that man may have evolved from apes. This discovery of such a primitive human led many to believe the theory may be true. When Erectus was first discovered, however, it was thought to be much more primitive than we now know it was. Java Man was first allocated to a genus of fossil chimpanzees. The following year it was assigned to the new genus Pithecanthropus. It was given the name Erectus because its femur suggested it was bipedal. At the time, a few scientists recognized the fossil as a missing link, but others largely disregarded it. Luckily, Java Man was not the only Homo erectus fossil. In 1921, two fossil human teeth were discovered in China and the world was interested. Subsequent excavations uncovered about 200 human fossils from more than 40 individuals. They were dubbed Peking Man. Among the material, five nearly complete skull caps were found. Now science had not only Java Man but also Peking Man. Separated by hundreds of miles, but they were seemingly very similar species. The existence of these ape men was now undeniable to the reasonable man. Both were formally renamed as Homo erectus in 1950. Since they were discovered in Asia, this led many models of human evolution to have an Asian origin. However, a few naturalists, including Darwin, pointed out that both chimpanzees and gorillas were African and only exist there. This Charles Darwin guy was really ahead of his time, huh? Throughout the 20th century, the place of Homo erectus in human evolution was heavily debated. It was only with further discoveries of the species and other human species that we got a true idea about their place in human evolution. The difficulty in understanding the species mainly strives from just how widespread and how long they were around for. It has been proposed that Homo erectus evolved from Homo habilis over two million years ago, though they still would have coexisted for at least a half a million years. The earliest remains of the species can be found in both Africa and Asia, which leaves a confusing tale for researchers. They were in China as early as 2.1 million years ago and in South Africa 2.04 million years ago. Some believe that Habilis reached Asia and evolved into Erectus there, and only later came back to Africa and Europe. 
Others suggest that Erectus evolved in Africa before quickly traveling to East Asia. Either of these theories could be both true in their own way. More primitive and more advanced forms of Erectus were certainly on the planet at the same time. It could be that primitive Erectus left Africa, evolved in Asia, and some returned to Africa with more advanced genetics. It is quite hard to postulate any theory given the complexity of this time in human evolution. There were certainly more primitive hominids like Homo habilis still around. They were able to mate with Erectus and may have set African Homo erectus back while the ones in Asia were free to evolve into more advanced forms. Using the words advanced and primitive in evolution is usually frowned upon. In the sense of human evolution though, advanced forms are typically more Homo sapien-like, and this includes smaller jaws and larger brains. Since Homo erectus existed for about 2 million years, the species varied heavily. The average Homo erectus has a brain volume of about 950 centimeters cubed, though middle Pleistocene individuals have brains as large as 1230 centimeters cubed. The average modern human brain volume is about 1350 centimeters cubed. So erectus varied a lot in brain size and other parts of their morphology over the vast amount of time they walked the earth. Because of this, there are many different forms that are sometimes considered subspecies of Homo erectus. Regarding archaic humans, there is still no definite consensus over what defines a species or subspecies. Typically, most human species are considered their own distinct species. Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, and Denisovans were all able to mate with each other and were all very similar. Even so, they are all considered different species. But for Erectus, since the forms are very similar and undoubtedly Erectus, the different forms are often considered subspecies. Here is a list of all of them. Many are geographically separated or separated by vast amounts of time. Homo erectus had a flat, more Homo sapien-like face than earlier hominins. Its skull was low and flat with a very pronounced brow ridge. These brow ridges are quite weird looking to us modern browless humans. We typically ask why did they have such big brows, but in reality we should be asking why don't we? The reason we lack them is likely a response to how social we are. Subtle cues caused by moving your eyebrows can mean a lot socially. We likely lost these brows to have more mobile and expressive faces. Brows in these ancient men also did serve as protection from impacts to the face. Modern humans have fistfights over petty things and there is no reason to think that that wasn't the case in these people. Their heavily built skull may have protected them from not only each other, but the hard world they lived in. The fossil record indicates that Homo erectus was the first human species to have featured a projecting nose, which is generally thought to have evolved in response to breathing dry air in order to retain moisture. American psychologist Lucia Jacobs hypothesized that the projecting nose instead allowed for distinguishing the direction different smells come from to facilitate navigation of long-distance migration. This seems unlikely considering humans do not have the best sense of smell. Like mentioned earlier, the average brain size of Homo erectus is about 950 centimeters cubed across the board. However, the average Asian Homo erectus is about 1000 centimeters cubed. Remarkably smaller specimens such as Erectus georgicus had a brain of only about 600 centimeters cubed. Overall, across all subspecies, brain sizes range from as low as 546 to 1251 centimeters cubed. This is a greater variation than seen in modern humans and chimpanzees, though surprisingly less than that of gorillas. They were very intelligent people compared to prior hominids. It is quite hard to study how smart these people were by looking at their skulls. However, a one-year-old Homo erectus specimen shows that this species lacked an extended childhood required for greater brain development, indicating lower cognitive skills. Their prefrontal cortex was certainly smaller than ours and certainly less complex. Regardless, they were the smartest hominids of their time and capable of a lot. 
Dentally, Homo erectus have the thinnest enamel of any Pleistocene hominin. Enamel prevents the tooth from breaking down from hard tools, but impedes shearing through tough foods. The body of the mandibles of Homo erectus are thicker than those of modern humans and all living apes. The mandibular body resists torsion from the bite force or chewing, meaning their jaws could produce unusually powerful stresses while eating, but the practical application of this is unclear. The premolars and molars also have a higher frequency of pits than Homo habilis, suggesting that Homo erectus ate more brittle foods. These all indicate that Homo erectus's mouth was less capable of processing hard foods and was better at cheering through tough foods, thus reducing the variety of foods it could process. This was likely as a response to tool use. Like modern humans, Homo erectus varied widely in size. They were as small as 146 centimeters or 4 foot 9 and as tall as 185 centimeters or 6 foot 1. They weighed between 40 and 68 kilograms, or 88 and 150 pounds. Though I suspect at 6'1", they would have been a little heavier than 150 pounds, because that is quite lean. But it is likely that they were quite lean. We like to imagine them as tanking brutes, but they didn't have access to three meals a day and they did not lift heavy weight. Their diversity in size was due to regional differences in climate, mortality rates, and nutrition. Like modern humans and unlike other great apes, there does not seem to be a great size disparity between Homo erectus men and women, though there is not much fossil data regarding this. Modern Homo sapien women are 15-20% to 20 smaller than men. This is not that much considering some Australopithecine men were about 50% bigger than the females. If Homo erectus did not exhibit substantial sexual dimorphism, then it is possible that they were the first in the human line to do so, though the fragmentary fossil record for the earlier species makes this unclear. If yes, then there would be a substantial and sudden increase in female height, which in turn suggests a vast change in social structure. Homo erectus had about the same limb configurations and proportions as modern humans, implying human-like locomotion. Homo erectus tracks in Kenya also indicate a Homo sapien-like gait. A modern human-like shoulder suggests an ability for high-speed throwing, which was likely a very important aspect of their life. It is unknown when our human ancestors lost the majority of our body hair. Genetic analysis suggests that high activity in the melacortin-1 receptor dates back to 1.2 million years ago. Losing our body hair would have allowed for harmful solar radiation to reach our skin. Dark skin may have developed in response to the loss of hair. It is possible that exposed skin only became dark in the Pleistocene, because the increasing tilt of the earth which also caused the ice ages would have increased solar radiation. This would suggest that hairlessness first emerged in Australopithecines. However, Australopithecines seem to have lived at much higher and colder elevations. The nighttime temperature can drop significantly so they may have required hair to stay warm, unlike early Homo which inhabited lower, hotter elevations. Populations in higher latitudes potentially developed lighter skin to prevent vitamin D deficiency. A 500,000 year old Homo erectus specimen from Turkey was diagnosed with the earliest known case of tuberculosis meningitis. It is typically exacerbated in dark skinned people living in higher latitudes due to vitamin D deficiency. Hairlessness is generally thought to have facilitated sweating, but reduction of parasite load and sexual selection have also been proposed. Regardless, we see in modern humans that skin is highly adaptive and changes color depending on the region. This adaptable feature allows us the ability to sweat, absorb optimal vitamin D, and also block harmful solar radiation, all dependent on our specific environments. Skin's pretty amazing. We know sweat helps cool us down, it is a fact. Since Erectus most likely had bare skin and the ability to sweat, it was able to cool down the same way we do. Different populations had different skin colors and some may have remained a little hairy. By the time of Homo habilis, upright running and jogging was already a well-adapted ability. 
but Homo erectus had a modern human gait and limb proportions. Erectus was a great runner just like us and even had good endurance. It is estimated it could have ran for five hours straight, given that the individual was of course already conditioned. This would have allowed them to do many things unique to them not only as humans but as animals. They could run down animals until they collapsed due to heat stroke and exhaustion. This strategy is still used by the sand bushmen of southern Africa to hunt herd animals like kudu antelope. They also could reach dead carcasses before other animals. It seems running may have evolved due to a change in our diet. We were running in search of prey. But what did Homo erectus eat? Well, it had such a wide and diverse range that populations ate vastly different things. The increase in brain size is often associated with a meatier and higher calorie diet. Energy expensive guts decreased in size in Homo erectus due to not only a more nutritious diet but also due to further processing of food such as cooking. This would have increased brain size indirectly while maintaining the same caloric requirements of ancestor species. Homo erectus may have been the first hominin to use the hunter-gatherer food strategy. This would have emphasized teamwork, division of labor, food sharing, and tool production. This facilitated a large increase in brain size. One of the most amazing things I find about this species is its love for very large game. Homo erectus sites frequently are associated with assemblages of elephants, rhinos, hippos, bovids, and boar. It is thought that Homo erectus was actually quite dependent on large game. For example, the disappearance of erectus from the Levant region of Asia is correlated with the local extinction of the straight tusked elephant. Hunting these large animals would have left a lot of leftovers. It is possible that the meat was preserved by drying the meat. We know from fossil evidence that they enjoyed bone marrow and it seems a lot of the carcass was eaten. But not all groups of erectus depended on such large game. Its diet varied widely depending on location. At the Gesher Bena Ya'aqua site in Israel, this group of Homo erectus ate 55 different types of vegetables, fruits, seeds, nuts, and tubers. They even used fire to cook plants that were otherwise inedible. Across the world they also preyed on amphibians, reptiles, birds, and invertebrates. At a 1.95 million year old site in East Turkana Basin in Kenya, the inhabitants ate many aquatic creatures. Besides bovids, hippos, and rhinos, they also ate turtles, crocodiles, and catfish. The large animals were likely scavenged, but the turtles and fish were likely caught live. Dentally, their mouths could not handle as tough food as their ancestors, but their tools and use of fire made almost anything edible. In 1999, British anthropologist Richard Rangham proposed the cooking hypothesis which states that Homo erectus speciated from ancestral Homo habilis because of fire usage and cooking two million years ago. This was meant to explain the rapid doubling of brain size between these two species in only a 500,000 year time span. Cooking makes protein more easily digestible, speeds up nutrient absorption, and destroys foodborne pathogens. This would have increased the environment's natural carrying capacity, allowing group size to expand, causing selective pressure for sociality, and requiring greater brain function. However, the fossil record does not associate the emergence of Homo erectus with fire usage, nor is there evidence that cooking was widespread at this time. Rather, the doubling of brain size can generally be explained by an overall more nutritious diet, not necessarily in need of cooking. The earliest evidence of fire being used by hominins in the fossil record is at oldest 1.7 million years old, but this evidence remains unconfirmed. There is evidence of reddened sediment in Kubifora that got as hot as 400 degrees Celsius or 750 degrees Fahrenheit over 1.5 million years ago. It is not confirmed that this was caused by humans because fires do occur naturally. But after 1.5 million years ago, sites like this become more common and about 1 million years ago, controlled use of fire is widely accepted by scholars. It is a fact that these species use fire, especially after a million years ago, 
but it is very likely they were using it long before then. It may have started with a simple bush fire. Primitive men may have approached the flames to find cooked animals inside and realize how delicious their flesh was. Maybe it was even a habit when a fire would start that they'd run into the flames immediately after going out to find free food. Perhaps they gained a sort of liking for this fire as it did provide them with sustenance. For a long time, fire was probably only produced when nature would make it, but eventually Homo erectus was probably making fires themselves with flint or friction devices. It is thought Neanderthals could start their own fires, and it is not so crazy to think that some late Pleistocene Homo erectus could as well. Homo erectus is credited with inventing the Acheulean stone tools, succeeding the Oldowan tools. They were the first to make large lithic flakes and bifacial hand axes. They were multi-purpose tools, sort of like the pocket knives of their day. Cutting meat, preparing plants, and cutting wood were all possible. They may have even been used to kill animals. Acheulean tools were significantly more complex than the Oldowan ones. They had a standardized shape and symmetry. These hand axes are found in mass in many sites around the world. The earliest records of these tools come from West Turkana, Kenya, 1.76 million years ago. Oldowan style tools were still used for some time before completely switching. Acheulean tools outside of Africa date to no older than 1 million years ago, suggesting technology spread to other people or perhaps were carried there in migrations. I have mentioned that Homo erectus undoubtedly hunted animals, and specifically large ones, but how did it actually kill its prey? For most of the species' existence, they didn't have stone tips to spears or projectiles. The first evidence of this comes from about 500,000 years ago in Homo heidelbergensis. More ancient erectus that were over a million years old likely hunted their prey with wooden spears, stones for bashing, and even hand axes for jabbing into prey. Wooden spears are a very simple technology. Even chimpanzees use them. They can be used for hunting small things like fish and amphibians, but even a wooden spear can be effective at taking down large game. To kill something as large as a bovid or a rhino, it would have taken multiple people and probably a variety of tools. Their great endurance was likely used to exhaust prey before thrusting spears and axes into their vital organs after which those hand axes would be very useful for taking apart the animal. A fascinating discovery regarding the tools they crafted was a bone spear tip that had barbs. This 800,000 year old piece of bone was most likely crafted by Homo erectus and it shows a level of complexity not seen in many other tools. It featured three barbs. These barbs may have been helpful when spearing fish as they are very slippery and can easily come off of a normal point. If they were able to craft complex bone tools, then perhaps they even made bone spear tips for taking down large game. We do not really have evidence of this from this time period, but to make a broad head out of bone would be much less complex than this amazing artifact. It is unfortunate that wooden spears and many other things made by these people do not survive the ages. One could imagine they had specific spears and tools for certain animals. Maybe smaller and lighter ones for small game, barbed points for fish, and large spears for large game. Besides active hunting, scavenging and foraging would have been a large part of their diet. Homo erectus was actually quite crafty in other ways than just breaking stone. On Java, Homo erectus produced tools from shells. Spherical stones are found at lower Paleolithic, African, and Chinese sites. They were potentially used as parts of bolas. This would indicate string and cordage technology. They also may have used clothes. It is unclear when clothing was first invented. Head and body lice diverged 170,000 years ago. Body lice can only inhabit clothed individuals. This suggests that modern humans were clothed well before leaving Africa. If they were in use before encountering cold climates, then it suggests that African Homo erectus may have had clothes. The oldest hide scrapers are about 780,000 years old. 
This of course does not necessarily mean clothing, but it is notable nonetheless. One of the most interesting things I find about ancient hominins is the art they produced. Not much exists for Homo erectus, likely due to them being very ancient, but we still do have some examples. An engraved shell with geometric markings is the oldest example of art about 546,000 years ago. Art making capabilities could be considered evidence of symbolic thinking, which is associated with modern cognition and behavior. Archaeologist Alexander Marshak asserted that the engraved lines on an ox rib found at an Acheulean lithic site in France are similar to the designs found in Upper Paleolithic cave art. Three ostrich eggshell beads associated with Acheulean lithics were found in northwestern Africa, the earliest disc beads ever found, and Acheulean disc beads have also been found in France and Israel. The Middle Pleistocene Venus of Tantan and Venus of Barakat Ram are postulated to have been crafted by Homo erectus to resemble a human form. They are mostly formed by natural weathering, but slightly modified to emphasize certain grooves that suggest hairline, limbs, and eyes. The former has traces of pigments on the front side, possibly indicating it was colored. Erectus may have been the first hominin to collect red-colored pigments, mainly ochre. Ochre lumps as old as 1.4 million years old are found in Tanzania and become more common throughout time. Red, yellow, and brown ochres were all used. It is unclear what these pigments were exactly used for, possibly to color objects or possibly even body paint. Regardless, this shows that they exhibited some sense of symbolic thinking beyond basic survival. They also may have made shelter. In 1962, a circle made of volcanic rocks was discovered at Aldevoye Gorge. Paleoanthropologists suggest that these rocks were used to support poles stuck into the ground, possibly to support wall or roof structures. In Europe, evidence of constructed dwelling structures dating to or following the Holstein Interglacial has been claimed in Germany. The oldest evidence of dwelling in Europe comes from a site in the Czech Republic from 700,000 years ago from the Cromerian Interglacial. The earliest evidence of cave habitation is in the Wonderwork Cave about 1.6 million years ago. But evidence of cave use globally is sporadic until about 600,000 years ago. Shelter is a natural human need and it is interesting that some of these shelters correlate with glacial periods but they were capable of even more complex construction. One of the most fascinating things about the species is their possible seafaring ability. Acheulean artifacts found on isolated islands have raised many questions. Some places have easy answers. During the last glacial period, the sea levels were much lower. This allowed hominids to just walk to places that are now considered islands. The problem occurs when we find artifacts on islands that were never connected to the mainland, sometimes even by many miles. Evidence suggests that Erectus may have been seafaring by as early as 1 million years ago in Indonesia. The island of Flores is famous for being home to the tiny Homo floresiensis. I made an entire video on just this species, so I'll not go into too much detail here. Long story short, it is thought that Homo erectus may be the ancestor of these hobbits. This is hardly a fact and researchers do not really agree if it's true. Regardless, we know that Homo erectus was in the area at the time and many think that they were indeed the ancestors of Homo floresiensis. But Flores is an island. An island that has not been connected to the mainland for even over a million years. This means that Homo erectus would have had to travel over 15 miles or 24 kilometers to adjoining islands and over 40 miles to get to mainland Flores. It is possible that populations of Homo erectus could have swam this far. Professional swimmers can swim much further than 15 miles with proper training and preparation. But the average person could only swim about 1-2 to two miles on a moment's notice and even that is very optimistic. It is very unlikely that Homo erectus swam there mainly because of rough waves, currents pulling you out to sea, and the fact that in a tribe of humans, there are bound to be some young people. 
and there's no way a baby or a kid is going to swim 15 miles or 24 kilometers. Flores isn't the only island that shows evidence of Homo erectus habitation. The island of Crete actually has hand axes that are over 100,000 years old. Now it is not known for certain which species made these axes. It could have been Neanderthals, Homo heidelbergensis, or Homo erectus. But for our purpose it doesn't really matter. If any of these species could have gotten to Crete, which is over 90 miles from the nearest land, then it proves that they must have been capable of creating some type of boat or flotation device. It is honestly so fascinating that one of those species made it to Crete. That is a very long distance. It is also possible that they were the first European mariners as well and crossed the Strait of Gibraltar between North Africa and Spain. Homo luzonensis is dated between 771 and 631,000 years ago. Because Luzon has always been an island, their ancestors would have had to make a substantial sea crossing and cross the Hugsley Line. Luzon is separated from other islands by well over 50 miles or 80 kilometers. Not a swimmable distance. Dang it, I just realized that some of you are going to suggest the aquatic ape theory, but please don't. I urge you to look up some criticism of this theory before blindly believing in it. There is a reason science as a whole has largely dismissed it. Anyways, as for the boat used, it could have been made in a variety of ways. A simple boat may have consisted of a single buoyant log or multiple logs bound together. They could have used this to swim alongside. A reed boat may have been possible. There was always the possibility that they made much larger and more complex boats that kept them above water. Something perhaps like a dugout canoe. But a dugout canoe even takes many days to make with steel tools. Unfortunately, archaeological remains of boats are very poor. Due to them being made out of perishable materials, they don't really survive. The Pesce Canoe is the world's oldest known ship, dating between 8040 and 7510 BC. There are petroglyphs from 12,000 BCE showing breed boats in the Gobastan Petroglyph Reserve in modern Azerbaijan, which was then on the edge of the much larger Caspian Sea. It's unfortunate that we may never know what these boats looked like, but with the knowledge that they must have created them gives us clues about their intelligence. To make a voyage spanning many miles of sea with crafts they constructed, a certain level of coordination must have been attained. This suggests that they may have had a complex language. Neurologically, all Homo have similarly configured brains, and likewise the Brocas and Wernix areas of Homo erectus were comparable to those of modern humans. These areas are in charge of sentence formulation and speech production in modern humans. However, this is not indicative of anything in terms of speech capability as even large chimpanzees can have similarly expanded Broca's area and it is unclear if these areas served as language centers in archaic humans. The hyoid bone is a bone that is very important for speech. A 400,000 year old Homo erectus hyoid bone from Castile de Guedo, Italy is bar shaped, more similar to that of other Homo than it is to non-human apes and Australopithecines but is devoid of muscle impressions and has a shield-shaped body, meaning Homo erectus lacked a human-like vocal apparatus and thus anatomical prerequisites for a modern human level of speech. Homo erectus likely used some sort of proto-language and built a basic framework which fully-fledged languages would eventually be built around. A hyoid bone from a 530,000-year-old Homo heidelbergensis is like that of modern humans, Another specimen from the same area shows an auditory capacity sensitive enough to pick up some human speech. So Erectus likely did have some sort of proto-language and undoubtedly had advanced social behavior, but modern speech as we know it was not present in their species. It is hard to tell what these people's social structure would have been like. The only fossil evidence comes from a site in Kenya of 97 footprints made 1.5 million years ago. The group composed of at least 20 most likely male individuals. This indicates some specialized task group, maybe a hunting party or border patrol. If correct, this would indicate sexual division of labor, which distinguishes human societies from those of other great apes and social mammalian carnivores. 
In modern hunter-gatherer societies who target large prey items, male parties are dispatched to bring down these risky animals. And because of their low success rate, females typically focus on more predictable foods such as plants and smaller prey. Homo erectus or gaster may have lived in large, multi-male groups in order to defend against large savanna predators in an open, exposed environment. Interestingly, dispersal patterns indicate that Homo erectus generally avoided areas with high carnivore density. So basically, they avoided carnivores, which makes a lot of sense. It is possible that male-to-male -male bonding and male-to-female friendships were important societal aspects. All animals are imperfect creatures. Through their lives, we are bound to run into health issues. Some less serious and some wicked enough to take one's life. In nature, animals are typically not able to stop health conditions from sealing their fate. If a lion receives a broken jaw or limb, that might just be the end for them. But humans have sort of thwarted this inevitability. The classic notion of survival of the fittest does not always apply. Especially in modern humans, individuals that might not even have functioning legs are able to reproduce and have a full and happy life. This ability to help and care for others is a large part of what makes us human. Further discoveries of Homo erectus have shown that many of them were very human. A 1.77 million year old skull of Homo erectus georgicus has given an important insight into the origins of compassion. The well-preserved skull belonged to a male of about 40 years of age. All of his teeth, except for the left canine, had fallen out. The tooth sockets had been reabsorbed into the skull, suggesting that he had lost his teeth several years before his death. This impairment suggests that he had been dependent on the kindness of others to survive. With only one tooth, he couldn't chew up tough meat or raw vegetables. Instead, he likely had to rely on bone marrow, brain matter, and soft plant matter. He was an old man at age 40. His body was likely not in the best condition as well. It is unlikely he foraged for all of his food. If he did, he may have starved to death given the state of his teeth. He was likely cared for and valued by his tribe. These people were not savages. Just like you or I, we don't ship our grandparents off to death when they are no longer useful to society. We are human enough to care for them until their last days. And this Homo erectus was likely cared for in the same way. It should come as no surprise to us that our ancestors, even as far back as Homo erectus, felt the same powerful emotions that make us human. They were, after all, human. This specimen is not the only erectus with an impairment. The 1.5 million year old Turkana boy had juvenile spinal disc herniation, a condition that is very painful and restricted him from walking, bending, and other daily activities. Yet the specimen survived into adolescence, which is evidence of advanced group care. At a site in Spain called Cima de los Huersos, a skull of a young child was discovered. This small and frail cranium shows us clear evidence of a serious brain deformity. This child likely suffered from severe learning disability that would have been apparent to its parents. Yet the child was not abandoned or killed. Instead, for at least five years, they cared and nurtured for it. Who knows why it ended up dying? Even eventually, if they did decide to kill it, they still cared for it for five years at some cost to the parents. Many other fossils exist of human species that cared for the sick and injured. This behavior may have first appeared in Homo erectus, although some suggest it appeared as far back as the Australopithecines. Even chimpanzees certainly cared for their kin, though typically in a much more occult way. To actually help an individual with their condition is much different than just caring for them. If a chimp had no teeth, he would probably starve, for the other chimps would not understand the problem. So it takes not only a certain level of intelligence, but also the ability to care for an animal to actually help their kin with a health issue. A behavior seemingly limited to the human line, although there do exist other examples. This species began to decline with the emergence of other human species. Its descendants, made up of their genetics, went out with the old and in with the new. Just like how Neanderthals and Denisovans went extinct, we slowly conquered and absorbed their genetics. 
it is likely the same thing happened to old Erectus. They would survive for almost two million years. It was only until modern hominins appeared that they were replaced. But it seems climate also played a role. In 2020, researchers reported that Homo erectus and Homo heidelbergensis lost more than half of their climate niche. The climate began to change 100,000 years ago and they likely couldn't adapt the same way other species could. The first Homo sapiens lived alongside them and encountered them on many occasions. The world 100,000 years ago was full of many unique human and ape species. On our trek out of Africa, we encountered Neanderthals, Denisovans, Erectus, and even very distantly related apes like Gigantopithecus. Back then, the world was a strange place. The movie Quest for Fire actually displays this world quite well. In the movie, the protagonist group of Homo sapiens ventures through a world of other human species and predators. One of my favorite scenes is when they run into a much more primitive group of apes. This was the reality of the time. If your group wanted to travel and find new food sources, you might just run into a more primitive group of barbaric beasts. And I can't imagine these meetings were often friendly. Homo erectus would slowly fade throughout the world. They survived in Java until about 100,000 years ago before completely going extinct. They may have survived a little later, but we don't know this for sure. These people are human. Just as human as you or I, in fact. They were the precursors of many aspects about us today. What they did on this planet affects us all, and their genes live inside of us today. Though they were quite primitive, especially in older forms, they were capable of a lot. In their more modern forms, they had fire, likely boats, and culture. They sort of never really went extinct because their descendants were the other species of Homo like Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, Denisovans, Heidelbergensis, Antecessor, and Floresiensis. And even some of these species genetics still live in us today. The way in which all these species are connected is very complicated and debated. Regardless, Erectus is the ancestor to about all of them. It is thought that Floresiensis in particular is a direct descendant of a group of Erectus about a million years ago. For Homo sapiens, Denisovans, and Neanderthals, our story is a little different. We are likely the descendants of Heidelbergensis, which itself descended from Erectus. It is one of the most important of our ancestors. It was the first to leave Africa, discover fire, make complex tools, cross the ocean, and form complex social groups. As we saw in the section about injured individuals, they were passionate people that cared for each other. Fortunately, we can appreciate their existence just like people will do to us one day. Well, I said just about all there is to say about these people. New fossils will be discovered, theories proven wrong, and new ideas proposed. Some of the things I said in this video will become outdated, and some of them probably already are. Feel free to leave any corrections down below. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe. It really helps out the channel. Check out my Instagram and comment some video ideas down below. I'll make videos about the history of humans, ancient animals, and also the occasional full-length documentary. This video was kind of like a full-length documentary now that I think of it. I'm looking at my audio recording right now and it's uh, an hour and 20 minutes long, so wow. I'll see you in the next episode of Ortho 2. See ya!